to this session called Big Data, AI, and the Future of CX. How would human look like by 2015? My name is Catherine, and I'll be the moderator for this uh, discussion. I'm passionate about customer experience. Hack, as the lead customer experience at Valtech, a global digital agency, I co-founded the Montreal community of uh, CXPA professional, and I teach CX at HSC. I'm so passionate about this subject that I mentor startups to make sure they put the customer at the center of the service and product, and my husband get me a book about customer experience for Valentine. So I'm very passionate about that. On the, um, we are all curious about what the future looks like. During this special pandemic time, a lot of business professionals wish they could see in the future with a crystal ball to see how the customer will hack post-pandemic. Unfortunately, you're never going to have a 100% clear view of the future because human behavior is unpredictable and tomorrow a new trend could come up. We could say that customer research and insight are your closest bet to a crystal ball. On the other hand, technology are growing quickly and help business create experience that increase the customer expectation. How can human employee create the same personalized experience compared to the new technology that continue to get leveled up at a fast pace? Will the future be human-centric or technology-driven? To answer this question, I have with me Dr. Youssef Ahmad Youssef and Sergio Frias. They will uncover the two sides of this question. Welcome, Mr. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. So I think I, uh, I'm the first one to start, Catherine. Yes. So what, what's on the dark side of the moon? Like, oh. is it, <laughs> how is it going to be technology? Please introduce yourself. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to share the stage with Catherine and Sergio. And uh, I'm sorry to say I will be bringing some of the dark side of my predictions. Uh, but that's to give the Sergio the opportunity to, to address, uh, you know, how we hope that human being will prevail by 2050. Uh, I will share my, um, my name is Youssef Youssef. I'm professor um, at Humber College in Toronto, but I am also the uh, president and vice chair of the Chartered Institute of Marketing and Management of Ontario. Uh, so www.cmo.org. Uh, I will let the, um, Sergio Frias introduce himself and then we move to the presentations that we are excited. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Youssef. I'm Sergio Frias. I'm the Chief uh, Customer Experience Officer at the Chartered Institute of Marketing Management of Ontario. And it will be a pleasure uh, sharing uh, our views with you. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you. So, Catherine, uh, shall we start? Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Yusuf, um, like, uh, how, tell us how technology will shape the future by 2050. Uh, so, uh, I, I will share my presentation and it's, it will be very quick. It's a lot going to hurt. Uh, so let me, okay. Uh, do you see my presentation? No, not yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Sorry about that. Technology has always imposing some, and I hope it continues like that. Okay. So application. You know what, my, my presentation is not coming, so I put it on my screen and I will tell you a little story, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about that, guys. For some reason, I don't wanna, we have a little time. So uh, let, me, let me do this exercise with you. And I know that uh, we all have uh, this look towards the future and let's close our eyes right now. And I want you to imagine 2050, where we as human race are living kind of what we can call a nightmare a world dominated by machines and everything is different. And we are invigilated in all like walks of our lives and all senses. So how does this look like to all of us, to, to you, to me and to humanity? Uh, this reflection will be basically on exactly how do we imagine the future departing from today, how things are working today. And let me tell you something. Uh, we have a lot of things that are happening at the same time. We are talking about the internet of things. All the devices are connected. The machines are connected. Even appliances are connected, cars and everything else. Talking about synthetic biology and genomics. Uh, the, you know, the genome has been a revolution. People are being able to edit uh, the, the genetic code, cracking into it. And the synthetic biology has been able to, uh, you know, create uh, 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 human organs. Let's talk about printing. You know, 3D and 4D and bioprinting. Uh, we can, we are able to print uh, airplanes. 
We are able to print cars. We are able to print even human skins. Can you imagine that? And let's talk about artificial intelligence and nanotechnology. Both are really empowering the development of you know, the biotech and bioscience. And not to forget what's coming ahead, and it's existing nowadays, even here in Canada, we are doing research on this, we call quantum computing. And the predictions are that maybe by 2020, we will have the first quantum computer operating. And guess what? The processing capacity of this computer will, will be 200,000 times the capacity of processing of the biggest or the best computer, supercomputer that we have nowadays here. Can you imagine that? What about society, though? And how our society is looking like today and how the society will be looking like in the future. Because of this uh, technology and development of the technology, uh, we see that the world has become kind of liquid. And we are living in a liquid re reality uh, that has been described by philosophers uh, like Zygmunt Bauman as the liquid reality. And obviously he takes on the economic side and taking on the technological side where trust, uh, people have, have, have been having breach of trust because the experiences have been not so well defined because of what? Because of the digital experience that has created uh, the virtualization and artificial intelligence is weighing in. And the digital business and the growing influence of artificial intelligence are creating what we call the cyber physical persona. And because of this, our reality has been what? Entangled. We don't know where my physical persona starts and where my avatar is weighing in. And obviously that poses a lot of questions amongst, um, amongst the most important one, I think, and, and there's a lot of consensus around this is ethics. What about ethics? Where are the limits between ethics, individual ethics, social ethics, and what are the boundaries of ethics and how, you know, bioethics will move along the side with this major development. So uh, in order for us to re reflect on this, I'm choosing one specific report that uh, brings projection about, you know, uh, it's called the Millennia, uh, Millennium Project and reflections on uh, 2050, how it would be looking like in three different scenarios. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of research, uh, 300 uh, futurist uh, technology for 45 countries, workshops, and then they came to the final report. And what I wanted to draw your attention to what they were talking about, uh, uh, focusing specifically on artificial intelligence, because there is a major discussion around the theme of artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence will be impacting the future by 2050 and how our human behavior will be impacted by it. And by this, I mean artificial intelligence has been classified in three stages by scientists. The first one is what we are living nowadays in 2020, which is basically called artificial narrow intelligence, where artificial intelligence specializes on one field. If, and, and we have a couple of them in drones nowadays, in autonomous cars, uh, algorithms uh, pr of prediction in the internet, and so on. The other one that is predicted to happen by 2030, 2030, 50-ish, is called a artificial general intelligence, which is the AGI, and um, or strong AI, or human-level AI. And this human-level AI is predicted to uh, be equivalent or taking over tasks that all tasks that an adult man can take or women. And it's, it's really troublesome. And this is coming. The third level, uh, Nick Bostrom, uh, a Swedish, uh, and prof uh, Swedish philosopher and professor at ne uh, Exford, he came with the term who, who, who calls super intelligence. And he is predicting that that may happen by 2040. 40, 20, 45 years, or, and maybe it takes more or less time, but this is a prediction. And through this, what we call digital superintelligence, he says that intelligence or artificial intelligence will be overwhelming or will be, you know, uh, superating the human intelligence. 
And that is troublesome because what I'm predicting now, and this is sorry about this grim scenario, if we continue this path without social responsibility, environmental responsibility, and a proper ethical framework, I am predicting the rise of cyber conscience by 2050. And if you think this is a crazy thing, I invite you to read an, an article that was written by the father of artificial intelligence, late MIT professor, Marvin Minsky, entitled or uh, uh, called Will Robot Inherit Inherit Earth? And then it, there's a lot of literature around this. Obviously, it looks like science fac fiction, but this is something that would would really impact the human uh, the human experience. Well, and how do we move forward within this framework? How things will be unfolding? And a lot of issues have been said about this, not only by Marvin Minsky, late Marvin Minsky, in his article in 1994 in Scientific America, but, but we have people like, you know, Morvac, a scientist from Morvac, uh, who wrote about the future of robots. We have Bostrom, as I mentioned, about the superintelligence, uh, the liquid life, and we have the Millennium, Millennium Product and projections. And look, let me tell you something. Based on all perspectives that I've looked at, all reports that I've seen and articles that I've read, and books that I consulted before I come to this session, I'm really sorry to say that if we continue this self-inflicted or self-imposed cataclysm, the future does not look as bright as we may wish for. So... I said that technology will be shaping and impacting the human, the human behavior too. We may be living in, as, as I said and predicted, uh, under the rise of the cyber conscience where machines have formed a government and we may be deemed to be second-class citizens. And if we're lucky, uh, we will be, uh, we will be you know, treated as bats. So now I will ask my dear friend, Sergio, Sergio Frias, Sergio, how customer experience will be looking like by 2050? Are yeah. there any nice, are there any <laughs> nice things? Yeah. Or humanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, what the, the the scenario that you painted is quite alarming, uh, particularly the rise of cyber conscience. This is something really important for us to consider. But the question at the end of the day is: Will robots take over? Will robots replace humans? And the simple answer is for, uh, you know, simple answer is yes, uh, to some extent, right? Uh, I can't answer the bigger question about all the aspects of our human life, but I definitely want to answer that question when it comes to, um, uh, you know, the, um, when it comes to CX, to customer experience, because that's what I'm, you know, uh, uh, an expert in. So it's, um, this is where I'm going to try to make a, a difference here. I will leave the rest of the question to be discussed in a different uh, environment. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Good. So, uh, so the whole thing, the whole discussion is, is this. I like, so we, we're talking about the impact of new technologies in uh, customer experience. But before we talk about customer experience, it's important that we understand what customer experience means. I have my own definition, which is basically customer experience is everything the customers go through while interacting with your brand, your products or services. Interactions that will create expectations and give rise to feelings and emotions that will cement memories on the customer's brains, which will ultimately drive their uh, thinking, decisions and purchasing behaviors, as well as the way they promote your brand, of course. However, if we look at a, uh, a report from user testing, they uh, uh, published a few other perspectives, a few other uh, experts in customer experience. And of course, I don't expect you to read all of that, and, and you know, especially because of the size of the, the, the letters, the fonts. Uh, but so what I'm gonna do, I, I did put together a summary. So if you squeeze all of that, what we'll take from all those definitions, which are current definitions of what customer experience is today, it's basically something related to feelings, loyalty, emotional connections, choices, expectations, people, becoming fans, caring, emotions, relationships, motivation, five senses, insights, delight, 
So these words were taken from each one of those experts' definitions of customer experience, including mine. So when we look at this, it doesn't look like something really technological. It's actually pretty human, right? So all those aspects are very human, are aspects that are directly related to uh, the human behavior and the human uh, way of interacting with each other. So for us to be able to talk about the influence of technology on customer experience, we have to consider that not only, you know, uh, the customer experience itself has to be considered, but also how people will change over time. So for us to, to, to make it easy, I created two types of consumers here. One is what I call the old consumer, which is people like me, people that were not grown in a digital world. However, there's the what I call the younger consumer, which are the people who were born and grew in a digital world. So if we consider this time span between 2020 and 2050, uh, we have to consider that the old consumer who currently is the main consumer is the more prevalent consumer in the marketplace because they're in a phase of their lives with the most uh, purchasing power. Those guys are not gonna be there in 2050, either because they're gonna die or because they're gonna retire and lose purchasing power or because they will simply not need more stuff as they grow older. However, the younger consumer, that one is gonna be growing, is gonna be in 2050 at the same stage of life that the current, uh, the, the, the people that we call old consumers today. So they will have a lot of purchasing power and they will be the prevalent consumer back, uh, when, when that time comes, right? But these people, they are growing in a different environment and they are changing, right? They are evolving. Uh, and they are evolving together with the technology that is following them since they were born. So the only things that will probably not change is the growth in access to information. So technology is giving more and more access to information. Our consumers' expectations, I'm going to show a study on the next slide that says that the customers' expectations only grow and the competition on value. So people value uh, more the value they get than the, the price or the cost of what they get. So uh, when I when, when uh, this study, the publicist media research study that was done for Oracle, they were trying to compare the older consumer and the younger consumer, trying to find um, similarities and differences between them. It's uh, quite surprising to me that older consumers and younger consumers are not that different, particularly when it comes to some specific aspects, like being fast solutions that will deliver something really fast. This is important for older consumers as well as younger consumers. Maybe more for the younger, but, but clearly both are really interested in speed. Being smooth, being simple, being convenient, this is the same. Both older and younger con uh, consumers, they both need the same. About end-to-end -end solutions, meaning not solutions that will require someone to go five different places, talk to 10 different people to get a solution. So end-to-end -end solutions are very important for both. And customization is very important for both either. The difference is that for older consumers, this is more translated into a personal approach, personal delivery of something. While for the younger, it's more related to personalized solutions. It may not involve a human at all. It can be all uh, digital, but it has to be something dedicated to him. So customization is a big thing for all of them. And of course, uh, for all of them, you know, people don't buy products anymore, they buy experiences. And this is only going to get uh, more intense as time goes by. However, there are differences, right? So an older consumer, typically when they have a problem, they prefer to talk to a person to resolve the problem. While younger people tend to prefer digital interfaces. While Older consumers, they are more interested on the details. Younger people are more interested in the functionality, how the, the, the functionality will deliver what they need. Uh, older consumers, they prefer ownership. They want to have their house. They want to have their car. They want to have their bicycle. While the younger ones, they prefer everything as a service. They uh, hire a, a, a Uber uh, ride. They uh, rent a bicycle if they need. They live in a rented apartment. Uh, while, you know, the older want to own everything. Uh, the older people, they typically have their most remarkable memories that were lived in a real life environment, while the younger ones can have some of those memories lived in a, in a digital format. And uh, the older consumers, their foot, their online footprint is a lot smaller and the younger ones is much larger. So 
older consumers typically they use one or two social medias they buy some things uh, online and that's it while the younger they are everywhere use all kinds of platforms everything that is new they try and they try to get the best out of it so when you look at these things that are in green uh, when you apply technology and develop more and more technology it will certainly help to make those things better easier simpler and more adequate to the growing expectations of the younger consumers which will become more and more prevalent more and more important while on the other side not that much so that's something that will probably be consistent with the fact that these people will lose their power as time goes by as a consumer so when we look at that and we think about big data artificial intelligence and other technologies they are actually enablers right so this is a very dynamic and constantly evolving scenario that's for sure and the question is what simo can do to help individuals and companies uh, to uh, tackle all those growing customer expectations and help people to deliver great customer experience. So a possible solution and what uh, CIMO is, is, is uh, ready to offer is the program NICE, which comes from, it's an acronym for Nurturing Insights About Customers' Expectations. So it's a people and organizational development program, which purpose is to transform process or product-driven uh, companies into uh, customer-centric organizations. So the idea is for an individual that takes this course, uh, they will be provided with knowledge via uh, online classes, and they will can become certified customer experience professionals at some point. Uh, on the other side, with the companies, they will also be given knowledge through a more consulting-like type of delivery of the content, but they will be able to become certified customer experience benchmarks. In other words, companies that are capable of understanding what customer experience means and capable of uh, delivering great customer experience that can be used as a benchmark in the industry. So uh, what is the NICE program? It's a, it's a program which purposes to deliver great customer experience and it's divided in eight modules. The first module is called context, where you have to find out where you are and where you need to be from a customer experience point of view and understand what are the difficulties, what are the resources that can get you to where you need to be. Benchmarking is basically trying to understand who are the companies out there that are defining your customers' expectations. They are very likely not in your industry, and the idea is to figure out what are the best practices that you can import and implement in your business to be able to deliver great customer experience. And ideally, get those companies to partner with you to bring them into your organization and help you to grow. On the, uh, the next uh, module is the CX mapping. The idea is to find all the contacts of your customer with your brand, starting from the very beginning, from the promise of your brand, and going through all the marketing that you do to bring the customers closer to the selling, selling process, the delivery, uh, the customer services, the performance of the products or the service, and even the disposition. So looking at the overall experience um, so that you can actually uh, prioritize where you have to fix first. The next one is the essence of NICE. The idea here is to grow the level of performance of your organization from a customer experience point of view. So basically, you have to have discipline for your people to follow the processes to be able to deliver a great customer experience through the uh, uh, operational effectiveness. But also, you have to give them attitude so that they can figure out ways to go around the process and deliver more to the satisfaction of the customer. And the, the next one is the perception, because sometimes the customers won't verbalize what they expect and what they dream of. So you have to figure that out to be able to amaze them. The next one is AAA organization, which is basically where you review the processes, you update the tools, you develop the people, and you look into the culture, making sure that the whole organization is targeting delivering great customer experiences to the customer. Great people with good intentions won't be able to deliver great customer experience if the entire system behind them is not supporting them to do so. Next one is knowledge sharing, basically mapping the knowledge that is inside your organization, making sure that this is shared so that everyone is in the same page and you have everybody with the same capability to deliver great customer experience. The next one is the right people at the right place. Basically, you have to map the people's profiles so that you understand where in the organization they would be the happiest. Because if they are happy doing what they do, they will very likely be a lot more productive and be more capable of delivering great customer experience. And the final one is the true meaning of service. People that are working with customers, they have to understand 
that there is no higher purpose than servicing others, right? So this is a very important part so that we can make all the other modules uh, to, to make sense. So at the end of the day, for the individuals, we're focusing on their attitudes. So we're basically preparing them to be teasers, to be insight creators, to be leaders of this transformation, of this change to deliver great customer experience. While on the company side, we're focusing on their organizational culture so that we can prepare them to be delight factories. They can be benchmarks. They can become friend setters, right? So at the end of the day, the NICE program, we allow individuals and organizations to first figure out what customer experience means to them. Uh, second, execute that transition, uh, that transformation, and deliver actually deliver great customer experience. However, giving them also the ability to understand how to implement new technologies without losing the human touch as they go. So what would be my conclusion? Um, first, no one can stop technology development. We like it or not, it will grow, it will change, it will evolve. Uh, it will, to some extent, emulate a few of the human aspects and behaviors, but not all of them. So the human is still important. Uh, the role of technology as an enabler uh, uh, of the delivery of great customer experience is undeniable. The customer's expectations will continue to grow. Um, the customer's profiles will continue to evolve. <clears throat> and the, uh, the evolution um, uh, the, the, the evolution makes it more and more complicated for simple humans to deliver uh, to the ever-changing expectations. So things are getting so complicated. The customization is bringing so many variables to the equation that simple humans will simply not be able to deliver. They will need the technology. Without the technology, it will be impossible to deliver to the, to the expectations that keep growing. So only augmented humans powered by technology will be able to deliver great customer experiences in the future with, because the future will have a lot of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity and under a huge demand for personalized solutions delivered with a human touch. However, to uh, Yusuf's point, a uh, strong and enforceable technology ethics protocol has to be created and implemented to assure that we will more likely be, become superhumans in the future instead of becoming pets for the machines that will take over. So this is basically what I uh, wanted to share. So I, um, uh, I'm open to questions and Yusuf as well. Uh, however, if we don't have a lot of time to uh, answer questions, we will be uh, opening a, a room, uh, what we call after party, uh, where, and the link is in your screen now. So you can go to that room and we'll spend another 30 minutes there. If anyone shows up and asks any questions, we can interact there as well. Maybe we oh, have a question, is... so maybe I can ask it. Yes. So what new skill you, will human have to develop to live in a in this new AI enhanced world? So it's kind of mixing your two subjects. Yusuf, would you like to answer that one, or can I? Okay, now you hear me. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the skills that humans need to develop are the skills to be a human. These are the skills that we need to develop because we often are becoming influenced by the machine behavior. And what most scientists have been talking about is the fear of us aggregating so much technology that we forget to be humans uh, at once. And this, this is what, what would be uh, you know, compromising the future of humanity in, in many perspectives that I've studied. Sergio. Yeah, I would just say that if we say no to technology, we'll be isolated, right? So humans have to understand how to bring technology into the picture and not take it away, right? So we, we won't have, we can't push it away. We have to embark on that uh, journey and, uh, and grow with it. Thank you. And to conclude, uh, Dr. Youssef, Mr. Frias, thank you very much. Uh, for audience of 18, 30 years old, young professional from all over the world, Uh, what would be your advice to help them prepare the future in regards to technology and customer experience? How can they prepare to 2050 because it's closer than we, it's sooner than we think? Uh, look, I, I've dealt with, with young people and I love them for a long time, my students. And, uh, and what I fear for them is that they're being shaped by with what the technology is and then they are not being influenced in as much as they are supposed to 
the technology. So we need to understand how technology operates, but we need to still have in the instinct and keep the human in us uh, with solidarity, uh, you know, uh, compassion, uh, looking towards the environment, the society that we live at. And these things are still distinguishing us from the robots, and I hope will continue for a long time. Sergio? Yeah, and, and to the question whether humans will be replaced by robots or not, uh, those humans that don't understand that they have to embrace technology and make it work for them, those will be replaced, that's for sure. Those that will learn how to use the technology for the good, uh, those are are going to not only survive, but they will thrive. They will have success uh, on, on the future. That's for sure. That's basically what I wanted to say to conclude my our presentation here. Thank you very much. See you at the after party. If you want to, if you have extra questions for Dr. Youssef and, and Sergio Frias, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was thank great. You. Thank you, Catherine. Bye. Thank you. Bye.